gentleman as the organizing chair of the winter school on astronomy yeah. 2020 nice to see you all. i welcome you nice for uh, the interdisciplinary talk that we're hosting this year it's the ninth Wabas merchant memorial lecture it will be given uh, on cosmopoetics and the untimely space of the mediterranean by professor stephanos the the session will be chaired by professor ho shang merchant so ho shang merchant was born in 1947 to a zarastan business family in bombay he's graduated uh, uh, in 1968, and uh, he went to Purdue University. His master's is from Purdue Uni Occidental College in LA, and at Purdue he specialized in Renaissance and Modernism. Anais Neen and uh, Anais he corresponded for four years. His book on Neen uh, in Discretions earned him a PhD from Purdue in 1981. And he is published by a Writer's Workshop, which also has published eight books of poetry since 1989. And he has several books of poetry and other works in his name. Uh, Merchant has attended a Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center in Massachusetts and lived and taught at Heidelberg, Iran, and Jerusalem, where he was exposed to various radical student movements of the left. He has studied Buddhism at the Tibetan Library in Dharamshala, North India, as well as Islam in Iran and Palestine. Uh, Rupa and uh, Rupa published his former books of poems, Flower to Flame, in 1992, and is popularly known for his work, uh, Yarana. Uh, so he has taught uh, for 30 years in Hyderabad Central University, and he's known for his uh, courses on poetry and surrealism uh, in Hyderabad University. May I invite uh, Professor Ho Shang Merchant? I thank the Birla Center and Pranab Sharma for hosting this lecture. And I thank my friend Stefan Dees coming all the way from Cyprus to honor me and my sister. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my sister. You can see very few people have a sister like this. She studied for a PhD in anthropology at Chicago University and taught in black colleges in the Chicago area for 24 years. She wrote a memoir of her Bombay childhood, which was outside, which some, might, some of you might have taken. In New Mexico, uh, she wrote a memoir of her Bombay childhood, and while battling a fatal illness for 14 years in New Mexico State, a memoir of her immigrant gardener's boyhood in Mexico. She left all her wealth to charity. She bequeathed me a small sum from which I arranged these memorial lectures in her name. This is the ninth and second last lecture in the series. Five men and three women, NRIs and Westerners, have spoken so far. Now, Stephanides is my friend. He has retired in 2017, and he's very lucky. He can write poetry all the time now. He travels, he has friends around the world. I don't think he has an enemy. I'm trying to make a leftist his enemy, but I'm not succeeding. But I will succeed ultimately, I think. I am a persevering soul. Uh, because they have to be exposed. These false leftists have to be exposed. Not Modi, but they have brought us to this impasse. Modi has jumped at the opportunity, but we gave him the opportunity. Trump has jumped at the opportunity, but Obama gave him the opportunity. You cannot force down throats of people what they are not ready for. Professors talk about all this in the university. You know, the world is not an ivory tower. And I'm a professor, and I know what I'm talking about. Thank you. Anyway, I'll read a lovely poem that I wrote for my sister. It's the best poem I've ever read. My 90-year-old high school teacher said, Ho Shang, it's the best poem you wrote because you felt it. I still talk to my 90-year-old teacher. Yes, that's the kind of student I was and that's the kind of teacher she was. Those days are gone now, I think. But you like Pranav. You should be nice to Pranav. You should remember him. Okay. I was very sick. I have hiccups for the last one week, but just looking at you, my mood has changed, my sickness has gone away, 
and I said, I'll read for you. Thank you for being here. And shame <laughs> on all those adult scientists who went away. If they come for dinner, I'll hit them with the stick. <laughs> I don't care who they are. They should be ashamed of themselves. My sister takes a long, long time to die. It was the dark of winter when the illness came like a thunderclap. They isolated an Indian girl in the Chicago snow, hoping this Indian disease would go away. But it was America that had killed her. The sickness in us is named America, and the long, long time of waiting does not die. She had waited long in the dark of her Lord, the Lord she called Father, who never had a kind word, the Lord who giveth and taketh away, and now is the time of taking away the man she calls Lord and manservant, the lover with fair hair and blue eyes, who ferries her hither and thither like Sharon does souls in hell, my sister, she hangs by a slender thread that cannot snap because the long, long time of waiting is never dead. And she called death as her brother, brilliant, charismatic death, death who loves and beguiles and kills but does not beget, death the brother who no sister in life can wed that unfulfilled love, that great longing that does not die, that the long, long time of waiting never dies. And now, in the brilliance of summer, of melting light and butterflies, she floats between dark and light as on a river a swan doubly glides, one half flesh, one half shadow, sister and brother, reality and reflection on one river. She has crossed life's flood on a reed. She awaits a boat now to ferry her to the other side. The long, long wait she waits for all of us will never die. Thank you, Hoshang. On the behalf of the chair of the session, uh, let me introduce you to the speaker of the evening. Uh, Professor Stefanos uh, is a cryptic bond poet, essayist and memoirist, translator, ethnographer, and documentary filmmaker. He began his academic career teaching literature at the uh, University of Guana for six years, where he developed a deep interest in Caribbean Car Carole, Creole and Indian diasporic communities and thereafter a lifelong engagement with India. He was professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Cyprus until 2017. He was a judge for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize 2000, the year 2000-2010. He is a fellow of the English Association uh, UK. Uh, representative publica publications include uh, Translating Kali's Feast, The Goddess of Indian Caribbean Ritual and Fiction, Blue Moon in Rajasthan and other poems, and uh, Wind Under My Lips. He'll be talking about uh, cosmopoetics and the untimely space of the Mediterranean. Uh, he would like to reclaim the radical uh, potential of cosmopolitanism as first taught by Mediterranean antiquity, pitting and boundless cosmos against the boundaries of the polis. In the process of reclamation, he would explore the notion of cosmopoetics as generative force of <coughs> mediation and uh, border crossing, bringing the very long duration to act on the event and the text. In the production of uh, untimely spaces, cosmopoetics has the effect of the discrepant uh, encounters and intimate estrangement reordering temporal and spatial visions and the ways of uh, being in the world within a social time. Drawing on notions of the space-time compression with reference to Lefab, Lefeb, <coughs> Baudel, Barthin, Delise, and Guthari, among others. I'm sorry I'm pronouncing the names wrong. 
Uh, he will discuss osmotic and translation movements in the range of authors including Ovid, Ibn Arabi, Oren Pamuk, uh, and several others. Uh, may we have a huge round of applause for Steph Knox. Good evening. And first of all, I'm greatly honored and to my friend Ho Shang, who um, invited me to be part of these series of lectures. We've known each other for more than two decades, and I got a surprise phone call to give this lecture a few months back. And I never lose an opportunity of coming to India and, and also to see a great friend. Um, he asked me to speak about, well, he said his preference. I could speak about what I liked was Greek poetry. But then I, I wanted to open up and talk more about the Mediterranean. Um, then I had a surprise call from Pranav, who told me he was asked by Ho Shang to organize the lecture. And he told me he was a curator of um, a space museum. And it was quite uncanny, because literally um, at a few minutes before, I had, I'd been reading Lefebvre's The Production of Space, and I had written the um, phrase no, in my notebook, untimely space, as something to think about. So um, I decided to bring in these two strands together um, and talk about the Mediterranean, but in, in relation to cosmopoetics which is a term that's floating around, but in, um, recently as um, a derivative around the debate around cosmopolitanism. And for me, it was also a way of responding to the term um, cosmopolitics that was coined by Bruno Latour. His um, notion of cosmopolitics was um, which I wanted to challenge. I didn't really like the term cosmopolitics because it sounded too much like global politics. Um, but the idea behind this term was a way, for him anyway, was bringing the radical aspect of cosmopolitics back into, um, of cosmopolitanism back into discussion. He was saying, he was arguing that the cosmopolitics is a way of preventing politics from the closure of the cosmos, and, uh, um, and challenging also the Enlightenment notion of um, cosmopolitanism as used by Kant, which universalizes and unifies one notion of cosmopolitanism and legislates against the multiplicity of worlds um, in the modern world. Whereas in, um, I've but to me, the, the term didn't ring true, and the term cosmopoetics um, is much more to the point, because if we go back to the origin of cosmopolitanism in antiquity, is what is happening is that the cosmos and the polis are in tension, since the, um, the, the notion of the polis, or the political entity, that um, was challenged by the cosmos. And this began with um, the school of cynics in Greek antiquity. At least the term did. The debate probably went before that. But the first time um, the term cosmopolitanism was used was in the third century BC by the cynic philosopher Diogenes, who um, was a kind of equivalent to a modern day bohemian. He lived a life of poverty, he lived in a barrel, um, and he challenged um, the society and politics by his lifestyle. Um, and Alexander the Great went to visit him, he heard about him, and his, um, when he asked, he visited him in his barrel, and when he asked him where he was from, he said, um, I am Ime cosmopolitis, meaning I am a citizen of the cosmos. And he asked him to move aside because Alexander was standing in his way between his direct contact to the sun. Um, 
and so in and this and he, he was called a cynic because the word cynic in ancient Greek the root of it is dog and because his bohemian lifestyle was considered to be dog like so his way of putting across his um, philosophy was a kind of performative poetics um, for example he would um, masturbate in the in the marketplace uh, and when someone called him a dog he would turn around and piss on him now I don't know if these are stories that come down but this is the notion of um, where why he was called this was the school of cynics why he was called a cynic but so in effect the um, what he's doing, the, the idea of the cosmopolitanism, then was pitting the cosmos against the polis and challenging the boundaries of the polis and transgressing um, these boundaries. Um, so, in effect, it's, I think what's happened in, um, in the current, often in the current discourse is that um, globalization has somehow um, taken over cosmopolitanism and taken away its radicality, whereas in fact it's got nothing to do with um, globalization because gl um, globalization is a transnational economy, it's like a supranational polis, if you like. So poli the cosmopolitan should, be, should also not only challenge the nation but also challenge um, globalization. Um, so the, anyway, this was the framework and I, um, one that of this talk and how this might apply to the Mediterranean. And in, I'm looking at the Mediterranean as if you like one microcosm, but in if, and how it may connect to other worlds. And Lefebvre, who I, re, who I happened to be reading when Pranav called me, for him, um, cosmic space contains energy, contains forces, and proceeds from them. An energy or force can only be identi identified by means of its effect in space. Um, actually, the, I don't know if I spe should speak into that microphone. I have a microphone here. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so what, um, for Lefebvre, in this whole space-time thing, that's uh, the, um, and space-time compression for for Lefebvre, space has primacy over time, and um, and although he's a leftist, I mean Ho Shang gave his own performative poetics about the left and saying he's trying to make me an enemy. Was that what you're saying? I'll tr maybe I should try and make you an enemy. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, although he was uh, Lefebvre was a leftist, he does differentiate himself from the. Um, uh, yeah, this is my speech. I won't. I'm. <laughs> okay. Good. I'm avoiding the Indian leftist. Don't worry. Um, so. Um, for Lefebvre, the space, the production of space has primacy, and he differentiates himself on the left from the he Hegelian Marxist rationality, whereas uh, and in th that um, it's the revolutionary con um, consciousness from um, you know the re the relations between the means of production. So what he's saying is, in fact, to get into real time. Um, we produce space, okay, um, and this is prime. What is um, primary? So, in effect, my notion of cosmopoetics comes from primarily through Lefebvre, with some poetic examples, and um, in effect, the production of space is also about the economies of seeing, if you like. Um, and and when I say economies of seeing, I'd like to go back to the etymology of the word theory in Greek, which is, the Gre in Greek is theoria, and originally theoria was not theory in the way that we um, talk about it now. Theoria 
was, is, has its root in the verb thoro, which is still used in my Cypriot Greek vernacular, which means to see. So a theoros is someone that goes on a journey or a pilgrimage in order to open up his vision. So the thra in theoria, in fact, is related to the Sanskrit etymology of darshan, dras. So um, theoria is about seeing. And a theoros is someone in antiquity that went on a pilgrimage. Um, so the production of space then is like opening up our economies of seeing. And I'd like to quote um, this a very nice poem by Adrian Rich, O to the Hubble Space Telescope, in which he says, the ecstasies of galaxies. So out from us, there's no vocabulary, but mathematics and optics, equations letting sight pierce through time into liberations, lacerations of light and dust. So the relationship between the poet and the artist or the human being to the cosmos is that we are part of it. It looks back at us, but we can only partially um, look at it. And it hides from us while simultaneously revealing itself to us, as does an object of art. Um, so there's this process of revealing and concealing um, that takes place, um, which is, in fact, behind the whole notion of cosmopoetics. Um, just, and also to ground it into my own island, my tiny island, um, which has much more in common, has a lot in common with South Asia. My engagement with India is not accidental. Um, and Mediterranean antiquity had a lot of um, connection with India, as well as its modern politics. But um, the philosophy of the cynics was passed on to what we know as the Stoic philosophers. And the first Stoic philosopher was Zeno, of Kition, he was a Phoenician who wrote in Greek, and he was, um, in fact, based in Kition, which is Larnaca, the airport where I flew out from while coming here. And um, he became a, he followed the school of Diogenes after he had an, a shipwreck and he had an accident. So there was the, this whole relationship between accident and substance that you find in Platonic philosophy. What is is an accident really an accident? Does it relate to, when does it relate to substance and when it doesn't? And Aristotle goes into all these different categories of what is an accident. Um, so in effect, life in the polis could be said to be accidental. And how does it relate to an essence or a substance that's inaccessible to us, but we pursue even though that we cannot totally reach and what's behind the Stoics is finding this harmony with this unknowable um, cosmos. Um, and we don't know his work, but it was passed on. We know it only through other people, such as Seneca, uh, Marcus Aurelius, and so forth. And then it has been recently reclaimed by French theories, Lefebvre being one, Deleuze, and so forth. Um, and what this, in terms of literature and art, one of the important genres that came out of this cosmopolitanism of the Diogenes was what is known as Manipian satire. It was satirical texts that Bakhtin had, um, in his dialogism, has taken up as being exemplary genre for these processes of transformation that take place in culture, where there is a time-space compression, where different times and spaces come together in a kind of estrangement. And it's the way they use language to create this kind of intimate estrangement in a kind of satire. I mean, one of the most famous examples is um, Lucien of Samosata's called The True Story, 
that also begins with a shipwreck and it turns into a kind of satire of the Odyssey. Also the Golden Ass, um, which, which um, is no problem. Um, also called Metamorphosis, in which um, the main character is practicing witchcraft and magic and he accidentally becomes an ass and then um, in the end he's redeemed by the goddess Isis to come back to life. Now these to a, a human form. Um, and so Bakhtin, what he, in, for these particular times in literature and art that, that create this kind of art, he used the term chronotope, which brings together the chronos and dobos, like time and place. And he, so the, he sees these as particularly radical and revolutionary um, moments in history. And in particular, you could say he refers to this as, um, so this notion of cosmopoetics then would be called, he would call idiotic after the um, Dostoevsky's The Idiot. Now it's again, idiotic is not only in its, um, the modern sense of the world, but in the original sense, which um, idiotis in Greek is something that's individual and private. So what the idiot does is challenge the authority of the social and the political because he's in, he's in tune with another force even though he does not know what this force is. So the discourse that comes out is idiotic. Um, in, the, in the original etymology of the term. Um, so um, in effect what they're assigning is a kind of theatrical performative poetics that comes through language as a way of intervening in the authority of the polis. And this is, the, so the role of the artist is in this intersection of culture and the nation state, if you like, um, is to mediate. So they are agents for cultural change, but they're also caught always between the state and the cosmos because they're not totally autonomous free agents. They're also tied to the polis and the state as they are to the cosmos. So, so there's a process of mediation and friction and fractures that come out. And it's from there that the, we get this notion of cosmopoetics. Um, in, t in coming more precisely to the Mediterranean, and I, it's a polyglot, a multi-religious um, region, a multicultural region, full of tensions um, of all kinds. Um, it's an inland sea that's supposedly almost, it's almost an inland sea. And in my own thinking about this, I've also been stimulated by writers from the Caribbean who refer to their um, sea as, a, often refer to their sea as a new Mediterranean. And their engagement with the Mediterranean is quite frequent. Um, people like Lissant, Walcott, Alejo Carpentier, and so forth. Um, and Glissant talks about the Caribbean Sea as, um, as an archipelago that explodes outwards and demands a poetic of, um, poetics of relation. And, where, and in contrast, he says, the Mediterranean Sea is closed in and you have all these religions of the one, the, the, the Abrahamic religions coming in tension with each other and there's no like breathing space. I think, the, um, the, I think the contrast is too sharp, but it was a challenging um, concept for me to start thinking also um, is a kind of refraction of myself, if you like, as a Mediterranean in relation to the other worlds. And I think what's interesting to note though is that there are fractures in the Mediterranean and there are tensions are not only between the, th 
the three monotheistic religions, but the tensions are found in these fractions, and these fractures are breathing spaces of people going in and out. And this has a whole mythology that goes back um, a long way. I mean, the three fractures um, are, um, and thinking about this, I, I'll refer to Fernand Brodel, who's probably one the greatest historian of the Mediterranean, a modern historian of the Mediterranean, who introduced the term the long duration, la longue durée. And he's saying that when we look at history, we, don't, uh, we spend too much time looking at the event and the moment. But in effect, um, what shapes who we are is not the event, but it's the long duration. There's a medium duration, there's a long duration. And for him, the long duration meant um, how the world is shaped and reshaped um, geologically and how we learn to live with these geological changes and how these geological changes go even further, um, go even f much further than our human histories. And of course, in terms of, he's talking about history, and so he's looking at empirical history, but in terms of artists, then besides the la longue durée, for us as artists and intellectuals and poets, there's also the très longue durée, the very long duration, which is inaccessible to us. Um, and it's, we can only, um, there's only a promise of this access. Um, and I think this has been there in the way that our um, imagination has been shaped through the ages. This is very important. And in terms of the Mediterranean, the, I mean, one of our most famous epics that you all know, the Odyssey, in which the whole point seems to be nostos and homecoming. But there's a lot of alternative narratives in which the homecoming never actually happens or that Odysseus gets distracted on the way, or he goes home, and when he goes home, he's dissatisfied because what is home is much too small. So the whole point in that journey is to go beyond, and to go beyond in the, in the alternative body, says that he was tired of being home, and he wanted to go beyond Hesperia, Hesperia being the, the westernmost part of the Mediterranean, the Straits of Gibraltar which was known as the Pillars of Hercules, that geologically would open and close at different times over millions of years. And when it would close, the sea would evaporate and disappear, so there was no Mediterranean. And then if it would open again, it would be replenished by the Atlantic. Um, and poets throughout the ages have um, given different turns on this. Um, like Dante in his um, sees Odysseus ending up in the inferno because he saw it as div divine hubris that um, Odysseus actually went beyond this fracture um, and therefore he had to perish, which seems to me like, you know, this kind of metaphor of the dark waters where you, the Kalapani, where you, it's the Christian alternative to the Kalapani where you lose caste, um, whereas the um, other people saw it as this opening up. And um, the Caribbean poet um, Derek Walcott takes up this motif in Homeros and remembers that Lisbon is, in fact, Ulisi Bona, the city of Lisbon. And he reflects on this journey out and this journey back. Um, so there's this crack in the sea. And of course, another crack is, the, um, is that of the Bosporus and the Sea of Marmaris. And I'll come to talk a little bit about Pamuk at um, because of this, uh, which is in our region is metaphorically east-west, and I come from an island that's right on this fracture, if you like. In fact, we're, we're and the division, the partition of the island between north-south, so in effect we don't know where we're the north-south of the east-west. There's this kind of whole fracture there. Um, and the third fracture was the man-made fracture of the Swiss Canal that came later, um, but and Walt Whitman wrote a poem about opening up our worldliness because we're opening up a passage to India. But even before opening up this passage to India, 
um, the Greeks and the Romans had a port on the east coast of Egypt um, that went all over um, the, not only the Indian Ocean, but right onto the Coromandel Coast, which is also known as the Pandian Mediterranean. So looking at it in the long duration, the Mediterranean is in fact um, connected, say, to the Pandian Mediterranean, Pandian Mediterranean. In fact, the first word in, in Greek, the word in Greek for rice, Rizia, was recently discovered comes from the Tamil Aris. So they probably brought rice um, from South India um, back more than 2,000 years ago. Um, so there's all these connections. And then if we look at Protel, even before these, this is, if you call this the me medium duration, because it comes within human history. I mean, even before that, the sea itself kept changing shape and it, and it reached at one point um, the as far as Indonesia. So, um, and what's, again, what's important in the notion of duration for Brodel is not duration itself, but is the fractures in duration. That if there were no fractures, there would be um, no history, no historical memory, because historical trajectories emerge from the breaking up of time through its fractures rather than um, just the memory of duration. Um, and it's the way the different fractures and the layers of time overlap with each other and create different trajectories. Um, so, I mean, this um, notion, so in effect, um, in poetic terms, and this also reminds me of the work of um, Walter Benjamin, which um, also, who talks about resisting information in order to remember a paradisiacal reality that we cannot really remember. In, um, he says, he talks about the promise of fulfillment in his task, that, we that in effect when we're writing, we're looking for a pure language that in effect does not exist that in language we're always bounded by this babble of languages. So the, the pursuit of the poet and his translators is a promise of fulfillment that goes beyond language, which is impossible, which he calls the pure language, which, is, which in, other, in other words goes beyond time. So it's in a sense he's also talking up about opening up space um, and resisting the rapid turnover of information that we find in the short duration. Um, I'm just skipping a few pages because I've talked through them trying to get to where I'm not following the script but uh, keeping the thread going like Ariadne's thread if you like. How am I going for time? Okay. Pardon? So if, is that half an hour I've spoken? Yes. Okay, good. I'm more or less keeping in time. Um, also, I mean, what's, um, what Brodel says about islands in particular is that this time-space compression becomes more acute in that... Um, um, on islands, and this is something I reflected on about my own island, which is in effect between three continents. I mean, we're very close to Asia. Beirut is like half an hour away, the, and the south, the um, Asia Minor coast is half an hour away to the north, and then Egypt to the south. And even though the, um, many of the, uh, my compatriots would claim to be Greeks, Greece is um, quite far away in effect and if we are Greeks we're Eastern Hellens and um, so in effect I mean we're a, na a very new nation state that was created as a result of um, various empires that were um, collapsing most the Ottoman Empire then the British took over then the British Empire um, and um, 
So in effect, where do we belong, and especially in the long duration? Because um, Hellenes, before the nation state of Greece, which was very recent, in fact, um, um, and perhaps the nation state of Greece came out of the European Enlightenment. So in effect, the, what, how Greeks see themselves now in the nation state of Greece is an invention of Western Europe. But um, um, the Hellenes were spread like th throughout West, Western Asia and Asia Minor and Egypt um, right up to very recently. Um, and so the island, in effect, although it's, it's insular, but it's also at the fault line of all these other different cr cultural crossings. And, and in fact, it doesn't, hasn't really functioned as a nation state very well. I mean, we had, fr it was founded in 1960, in 19, by 1974 it was partitioned. And um, we began as um, part of the non-aligned movement. Um, we're a Commonwealth nation, but only 15 or less than 20 years ago, we became a, um, a member of the European Union. So how we see ourselves also depends very much on your poetics and your politics. And I, like Diogenes, would say I'm a citizen of the cosmos living on this island that doesn't really know which way it's going. Um, and in the course of the 20th century, and I just want to give this quick history in order to introduce the two poets I'm going to talk about briefly. I mean, this diaspora began to um, shrink um, with the rise of nationalism, with the breakup of the... So the millions of Greeks that were in Asia Minor um, we had a kind of partition in 1922 when the Ottoman Empire began to break up. There was, um, and we, there was a war over territory and there was a huge displacement of populations. So instead of these multi-religious empires, we became all these ethnic nationalism arose, the rise of the... Um, so Greece really did not emerge the 19th century, and even where it, um, parts of the territory were not added until the 20th century. Um, and so they all left Asia Minor. Then all the conflict in the Middle East, there was lots of Hellenes in Western Asia, in Lebanon and so forth. The, they all left, and then the Suez Crisis, all of the Egyptianized, foreigners also left. So there was these huge shifts of populations um, that brought about who we are now. Um, and at the same time, you know, Greeks started saying we're Greeks and Turks started saying we're Turks, even before, and before that we were all intermingled together under the Ottomans. Um, so the challenge then is to find the cosmopoetics that Reifies these undialectical divisions and imperial geopolitical discourse and resist the pressure on both the existing socio-economic entity, the Europe of capital, and its cultural and political support, the European, the Europe of the Enlightenment. Um, now there was a crack or an opening up of space in 2003, because in the division on the, of the division of the island, the partition came in 74, and no one was allowed to cross at all. You know, if you're a Greek, you stayed south. If you're a Turk, you stayed north. And then when um, we were going to join the EU, there was a suddenly crack in these borders, and they said, "Okay, you can come, but not to stay." Well, it's not a solution, but it was a crack. It was a space and people began to go back and forth. Um, so it was a space that opened up to chasing ghosts, traversing deathly places of struggle on a ruptured island, seeking moments of memory beyond knowledge, um, looking for flashes of il illumination in an undecided subjectivity of a traumatized borderland nation. And so the imagination is caught 
between nostalgia for something already dead and buried and a future and sick un anticipated but yet to unfold and to be told. Um, so in effect, it was a sense of temporal incommensurability, um, which is a famous concept that used by Bloch in German, Ungleichzeitigkeit. The spatialization of the temporal brings dissimilarities next to each other, which call for a transcultural poetics that opens up our relation-making capacity, the pos possibility to recover what might have been denied or seen obsolete, and transform our experience of worldliness through a process of unforgetting. Now, the term unforgetting is a literal translation of the Greek word for truth, which is aletheia. Um, like Heidegger used this trope, because the word aletheia has its root in lethe, like the river of lethe, the river of forget forgetfulness. And you put a in front of lethe. So a, in fact, an, is denying forgetfulness. So truth is actually unforgetting, which means there's already um, a memory of this original cosmic force and our sense of being in the world that is in fact forgotten by living in the polis, um, which we have to exercise in able to unforget. Um, and this term is also taken up by um, Maurice Blanchot in the space of literature and in which Blanchot suggests that if nature offers as well as denies itself to utilization, then it forgets itself in the real. And the experience of art is always original and at all moments a beginning and the mirage of the future's inaccessible truth and thus intervenes in the reigning order of experience. So in this respect, the cosmopoetic is linked up with the pursuit of an originary vision which we can never access, but it's the fire of that pursuit that is what nourishes the possibility of artistic expression. Um, and by a meaningful coincidence, an accident, perhaps a cosmic accident, when um, the, the the book, Pamuk's book, My Name is Red, came out straight soon after the opening up of the border when I was crossing. And um, I crossed paths with Pamuk at a Katha festival in Delhi, which was a very interesting coincidence because uh, people, some people mistook me as Pamuk. And I said, it's okay, he's Greek and I'm Turk, but we're all the same really. And I was, then I was asked to introduce him, and we had an interesting conversation about homecoming, because I told him I went back to my village after 40 years, and he said, well, he'd never left his um, home um, uh, since he was born. He was still living in his same home. Um, so we're comparing experiences, and, I, and it also... Um, made me think about all of these notions such as nostos and homecoming and what it means to be in the world. And I read his book with great engagement because it's set in the early part of, um, not the, um, it's set in the 16th century, which is soon after the, not long after the fall or the conquest of Constantinople. I say fall or the conquest depending on which side you're on. You can be on both sides. <laughs> and, um, and in a sense, he also makes an interesting counterpoint or chronotope with um, Ibn Harabi, um, the wonderful poet and philosopher of Andalusia, who was also writing just before um, the fall and the conquest um, of Granada. So I began to read, uh, I was totally absorbed in um, in um, 
in the novel, in the sense of emerging myself in these layers of temporalities and knowledge in, in this contrapuntal chronotope um, before our knowledge was, an, or our experience of the world became nationalized and, and certain boundaries um, were um, put around it. Okay, because I was, when I was a child, I was, it was the um, independence war against Britain and we were waving around flags and so forth, which ended up in disaster. So it was like a flood of memory. Um, and um, what's interesting is also what I, it's the ontology of the imagination that he explores. Um, both in Ibn Arabi and in My Name is Red, because My Name is Red, um, the whole narration is around images, okay, rather than reason. And this goes right back to Ibn Arabi and his, um, uh, his ontology of the imagination. I'd like to quote a little bit, um, in which he says, Arabi's believes in the eyes of reason, ideas may be either true or false, whereas imagination perceives notions as images which truth, whose truth can be both true and false, and at the same time neither true nor false. It incites hira, a perplexity that disables our rational faculty and enables an opening of a visual economy. And he talks about imagination as one of the heart's two eyes. The one eye, that is Quran, unifies and brings together. Whereas the other eye, that is Furkan, differentiates. So the word Kayal means image, shadows, dreams, and vision. And images bring together two sides and unite them as one. It is the mirror as well as the object that it reflects and neither the mirror nor the object. So any image I may have is both true and false, neither true nor false. There is a doubling, therefore, in our visual economy or our economies of seeing, or in our theoria, if you like, for 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, which seeks the moment of transformation and mediation. Um, So these two writers, Pamuk and Ibn Arabi, from opposite ends of the Med Mediterranean, centuries apart, come together in this chronotope. And while Pamuk is exploring the discourses of colonialism, orientalism, secularism, nationalism, modernism, um, but all through images. Um, and it's the kalem, the pen of the writer and the illustrator, um, which is the potential of art to accommodate or give agency to heterogeneous desires where the constraints of ideology and politics fail. So, where the po so in effect, it's a cosmopoetics. He's showing where the polis fails, but the, um, the vision, the cosmic vision, opens up a space. Um, In effect, um, it's written not so much, I would say, as a nostalgia for an Ottoman past, because a lot of people have made this critique that um, they're look, we're, I mean, he's looking at the, the um, pre-modernity, but I don't think not as a nostalgia for pre-modernity, but as a way of opening space up to look towards the future. Um, that essentially exploring worldliness with reference to aesthetic and philosophical and religious debates. And the miniature painters are looking for divine perfection without achieving it because you're, the ultimate achievement of this is to go blind. I mean, there's a lot of um, motifs about 
um, though about between blind and seeing, that in effect, ultimately, the artist goes blind and it's through remembering the darkness of Allah that they're painting this vision of paradise. And then the tension is with the Venetian painters, which are now coming in from the West and having a great influence, which is to um, paint reality as they think they see it. And then you get a tree from a miniature that speaks back to the painter and says, I am not a tree, I'm o I only mean a tree, and I don't want every I don't want to be a tree for every dog in Istanbul to piss on me. So, and there's, um, so there's these fractures and tensions come up with a lot of these metonymic anecdotes, if you like, that unfold this philosophy. Um, what interested me was also reading Pamuk on Kavafi. Kavafi is my favorite modern Greek poet who was an Alexandrian he lived in Alexandria from a, a family from Istanbul. And these two cities, I mean, for Cyprus, are much more important than Athens, which is quite recent, because Alexandria was the capital of the region that Cyprus belonged to, and then later on Constantinople and the Byzantium, and then under the Ottomans also Constantinople. So we're Eastern Hellenes, if you like. And, um, um, and Pamuk writes about Kavafi, and he tries to reimagine him. He feels a sense of loss. He imagines him as an, an Istanbulite, and who perhaps had his first love affair in this city, and so forth. Um, so he, he looks. Um, so he he creates this deep connection, um, which in effect was part, would have been part of the region, say, hundred years ago. And I came across this. Um, I think it was three or four years ago. This is not one of his well-known poems. If you know Kavafi, you'll know poems like Ithaca and the city and so forth. This, this was not published in his um, lifetime, but it was also, but it really struck me that it was written in 1914 when the nation state of Greece was um, consolidating itself um, and the Ottoman Empire was breaking up. And, um, and it's written in the figure of apostrophe that he's having an imaginary conversation with a peripatetic philosopher of the third century BC from Asia Minor. And he says to him, so we are close to arrival, Hermippus, the day after tomorrow, but now we sail on our own seas, waters of Cyprus, Syria, and Egypt, waters of our beloved homelands. Why so silent, ask your heart? Didn't you rejoice the further away we sailed from Greece? So, um, which is, was so radical in 1914. Like, in other words, homecoming is not going home to Greece, it's sailing away from Greece. Um, he says, let's own up to the truth. We are also Hellenes, what else are we? But with Asian loves and emotions of Asia, but with loves and emotions sometimes estranged by Hellenism. The blood of Syria and Egypt the fl that flows through our veins, let us honor and display. Um, so it's a moment of intimate estrangement, a, a discrepancy of different worlds coming together or falling apart. And, and, the whole, and I realize the whole of his work is in fact coming from um, this kind of um, crossings that has been Alexandria and Istanbul for, let's say, the medium duration, not the long duration which goes to um, before, um, before human history. Um, so it's a moment and a gesture of becoming um, and disentangling historical forces to reveal the moment that came before or after without knowing or understanding that we are part of it and not nor the force that gave origin to its unpredictable trajectory. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit about language because I, I think I only have five or ten minutes left. I'm, I mean, what I was going to say about Seferis, but I won't go into it. I'll just talk about briefly because also Seferis, I like him less than Cavafis, although Seferis was the one that got the Nobel Prize. But he, writing um, four decades later, he's in a similar predicament. Um, he is also from Asia Minor, and his family was displaced um, in the 1920s with the exchange of populations. And he found himself as a diplomat in Cyprus, and he got very entangled with Cyprus because it, it reminded him of the Eastern Hellenism of his childhood rather than Athens where he was then living. Um, and Cypriots tend to nationalize him, and there's a famous poem called Helen, which they see as a kind of assertion of Hellenism and what is Hellenism. But when you read the poem Helen, in fact, um, he's saying, well, Helen didn't go to Troy at all. She went to Egypt. And all this war was of the Tro with Troy was all for nothing. She's just an illusion. And who is she anyway? And what is this island? And what is our dark beginnings? But um, so if you deconstruct it, it's in fact deconstructing this um, whole nationalization of, it, of the Hellenic um, in a way that um, also is picked up by um, in Homeros by um, um, Derek Walcott. I was um, like quite fascinated reading Walcott, and there's one line, and in fact, Walcott did read Seferis and he wrote a poem to him. He, got in, he was engaged with, with his poetry, although it came later, and then Athens made him, gave him an honorary doctorate. In, and there's a line by Enomeros in which he says, um, again, looking at Helen, this is the Helen of the Antilles, of course, not the Helen of Troy, and he's saying, well, why cannot we see Helen like the sun saw her, why this Homeric shadow? So, and, and I think this is also the, uh, much of the force of Homeros. It's also going, looking for this originary vision before all of these layers, symbolic layers and symbolic orders came through and interrupted. And of course, it's impossible to see Helen as the sun saw her. And um, there's many layers of Helen, if you explore it deeply. Um, because we're, I mean, I'm running out of time, but I did want to talk a little bit about um, language, since we're talking about the language arts. Do I have five minutes? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, coming back to Deleuze, who also reclaimed um, cosmopolitanism, I think what also is... Um, interesting is his reflections on the notion of, well, he calls it minor literature, which is a bit of a misnomer, which he coins the term when he's talking about Kafka, and he talks about towards the minor literature. And Kafka, um, who lived in the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire, and he wrote in German, but he lived in what is now the Czech Republic, and um, he was of Jewish origin. And he talks about the impossibility of writing in Yiddish, the impossibility of writing in German, the impossibility of writing in Czech, but the impossibility of not writing and then eventually writing in German. So in, what, what Deleuze is saying, that in effect, and I think I mean, it's that he's writing in these, has to write in this inter interstitial spaces and challenge the symbolic orders that each language um, represents. And to me, this is also what cosmopoetics is, does, that we are, I mean, there's, we're all caught, and especially, and knowing also the Indian situation and my own situation, um, we're caught between vernacular language and national language, um, the mythical and spiritual languages of the past that in my region would be like Ottoman Turkish or classical Greek or Byzantine Greek. Um, and the Cosmop international languages that also in for us is also English in the past it would have been French and Italian 
And in the, but in the process of writing, um, we are all writing in all of these, but also consciously reflecting and redistributing them in order to produce space. Because all of these are, are all these linguistic um, categories are also spatial references, like the vernacular is what is here, the, the mythical and the spiritual is what is elsewhere, the um, international is what is everywhere, and then the referential is what is, is what might be the national language. So I, I, you know, I would be caught between Greek, Turkish, French, Italian, English, and, and, and you can make your own analogies in the Indian context, because I'm sure most of you probably speak at least three languages. Um, so um, I think this is what's also at the heart of cosmopoetics, is reaching out for this force that we feel it's there and negotiating it through different levels and registers of language. Um, so in a sense we're compressed, this, we go through moments of compression and explosion. This is why I like Glissant's challenge at the beginning of talking about the Caribbean as being explosive in the Mediterranean has been compressive. In fact, we, are, we all are exploding and compressing and scattering and bringing the similarities next to each other and modes of non-comprehension, -comprehen charged speechlessness, but um, looking to find these osmotic moments of transformation or metamorphosis where we can reimagine what has been denied or excluded or appeared to be obsolete in the political um, in order to open up our worldliness and our ways of seeing and unexpected, unexpectedly mediating human meaning in social time which is perpetually moving across multiple temporalities. Um, and um, Okay, I could end there. Can I say, I'll read a few lines of, my, of a poem of mine, because since um, you asked me to, to read something of Seferis in Greek, but I'll, I'll read a f just a few lines in Greek since you wanted to hear Greek, and then I'll translate it into, I'll read the English original, I write in English, the Greek is a translation. Um, but in, in the context, I mean, it's also um, in terms of my own poetic persona, if you like, I very much identify um, with the figure of the terjuman, in Greek we say dragomanos, which comes from terjuman meaning a translator, who was very important in the Ottoman Empire, and one of our important monuments in Nicosia uh, is the house of the dragoman. Um, so they were always at the razor edge between all of these different cultures and often um, came to a, a deadly or fatal end. Um, so um, in, ref in walking around this monument, I, um, I integrate into my own poetic persona. Um, first in Greek, just a few lines, and then I'll read more in English. Ego ime dragomanos, etera dislexios, xerizono ta omata yena afu Christo. Δεξιοσύνη και αυτοσχεδιασμό, θόγκο, κόσμο, τραχύφωνο, επίορκο και αφυσιωμένο, υπέρμαχε ψυχώσεων. Δεν είναι η γυαλιά μου, φτύμα πάντων των ανδρών. In English, I am a dragoman, courtesan of the word. I pluck my eyes to hear with skill and improvisation worlds of hard edges a treacherous and loyal exponent of obsessions. Not all men know my speech. In the night I go under in company of dervishes and learn why cyclamen sprout in pavement cracks and mutter promises amidst the dust of the beautiful and the unseen. I ask meaning for forgive, forgo, for play. 
an island warbler still with no quarrel, or a swallow in the line of flight meandering with finality, knowing that the road is lost in floating debris of fortuitous choices, precipitous moves. With impulsive sagacity, I swirl and sail away, vexed in my state of grace. Daytime, dragoman, nighttime, dervish. Can you take questions? Yeah, no, I think, um, well, I think translation is very important as well. I mean, it's something that um, goes hand in hand with writing. And I think, that, I mean, the final things I said um, about language, I think also apply to translation. And I insisted on this book being bilingual and parallel because it also, it's like the, the thing about Ibn Harabi that I said, it's also, um, there's no, it's the reflection and the shadow and you're looking for the source between the two. Because it, I mean, although I write in English, the other languages I have affective relations with because of daily life and experience inevitably permeate right through. So um, when I'm writing, I'm thinking, well, if I choose this word, um, it could be, it would have these connotations because it's vernacular or if I, or because it's international or do I, how do I play around with that? And working with the translator, of course, when I'm translated by languages, I don't know, I can't do that, but it can come out in the dialogue, but working with a Greek translator, because I know Greek, um, it plays out differently in the Greek. And, some, and I like the different play. And um, because it works well sometimes, in, and sometimes it'll affect the way I will write the next thing um, in English. So it's a constant process of like redistributing spatially and temporally. You're redistributing. You redistribute when you're writing because you're already writing and you're saying, well, how am I going to distribute these values in language? And so when you're redistributing it and you're redistributing it in a new way, then um, you're creating different spaces. So if you put the, tr the different versions next to it, then the spatial interactions that take place, then it's opening up even further space. Um, I guess, um, I mean, I was caught up as well with the whole um, post-colonial discourse as a post-colonial, in fact, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it swept me in at some point. Um, and, um, but um, I think it's, um, may and maybe it, had it, it's, it also had its role at that moment in history. But I think it's good that we're going post-post-colonial because you do get um, caught up in, well, what was initially a binary, and then I think post-colonial discourse tried to break the binary itself by looking more at the transcultural. Um, so yeah, no, I'm very, I think it's, um, it's good to go beyond. And I think this is why I'm, I'm looking for new conceptualizations. Um, so instead of looking at, um, at the colonial versus the post-colonial, I mean, looking at the cosmopoetic, in other words, I'm interested more in denationalizing because uh, um, there was, a, um, I mean, I think the, the, the assertion of nationalism came out of post-coloniality and then post-colonial tried to break with this by looking at the transcultural, but I think we also have to go beyond that. And I, I mean, if we look at the world literature as a kind of system and how it circulates, how, where it's produced, how it circulates, how it's received. So there's multiple trajectories. So I think it's good that we go beyond. And I think this, prob this new Indian writing is very interesting um, because it's going beyond that. Um, and sometimes we got into, um, uh, well, useless arguments. I remember, I think, when Amitabh Ghosh turned down the Commonwealth Writers' Prize because it only awarded it to people writing in English. They don't now. They 
they've opened up, not to everything, but to other languages. Um, but the other side of it, and I wrote an open letter to him, is yes, but people in Cyprus read something like the shadow lines and totally identify with it. And so the English is that we use in Cyprus or use it in India is... Sorry? Oh, okay. Shall I... Is it better now? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, um, also, it's... That, I mean, um, there's other ways of connecting through English as well. I mean, I... I write in English, I feel by necessity, because it's become my dominant language, but um, I'm also working with all the other languages in my imagination, and I try and break open the seams, not see the registers of English as uh, the English that we grew up in, by bringing, um, bringing in other stuff, you know, and in the context of my island, I will bring in Turkish <coughs> words and Greek words, and words from other languages I've, yeah. I've experienced or lived. So I could see Amitabh Ghosh's thing, and, the, and, the, and, and it was partly a response to the predominance of post-colonial English and, and trying to take a radical point of view after Rushdie said nothing written in India um, was um, outside of English as any good or something, and he got himself into trouble in the 90s. So I th but I think the, the stuff that you poets are writing is really very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's... Um, okay. That's better. Um, yeah, I mean, and, um, I, it does come in different languages, yeah, um, and I think inevitably. So it's not just um, it's not just fireworks to be impressive or write chutneyfied English, but it's also an effective connection. I mean, um, and this is sometimes where um, sometimes I, um, if I'm writing, say, about the village and my, vi I will the words that come to mind would be like, for one thing, the, the great molasses, which we use for various things. There's a very Cypriot vernacular word for that. And when I, I wrote a poem in English and I wrote great molasses and I was thinking of, well, why can't I use a Cypriot vernacular even, even if they don't understand it, they can find out. And then my translator, went for the Cypriot vernacular rather than the standard Greek, and another Greek went for the standard Greek, which is a national reference. So I said, no, I don't want the standard Greek there. That's n too nationalistic. I want this one, because that reaches out to my heart. And, and then I brought it, although I didn't write it in the original, I brought it in again in another piece I wrote. So th there's a kind of circulation and an awareness of all these, the, um, the the gaps and the frictions between languages. So there has to be some effective relationship in whichever language it is. And I'm sure it's the same with your experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's someone else. Yeah. Oh, you can, please. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you.